Planning District meeting, and thank you for coming as we do the people's work at this time. Would you please stand for the pledge? information to you this morning. A part of our retreat was talking a little bit about vulnerable populations, how we're going to look at regional approaches and things that we can do to um, assist in vulnerable populations. Being with persons with disabilities as well as seniors, um, senior services has done a remarkable job of putting together some plans. And the other part of what we talked about in our retreat was listening to best practices around this table. If there is an initiative or a plan that you all have come up with in your locality, we want to be able to use this um, area and this time through on our board meetings to kind of talk about some best practices. And when John shared uh, the, the blueprint of livable communities with us that he has worked on with senior services in conjunction with Dr. Bernard Bailey, we thought that this would be a great kickoff presentation for you all to enjoy and see the wonderful work that Chesapeake and Senior Services of Southeastern Virginia has been doing. Um, the, the HRPDC actually sits on the board for Senior Services. We have two board spots. Mr. Keating and I um, work with Senior Services on this side of the water uh, quite intimately, so we know that the work that they're doing in this area and the work they're doing on the peninsula as well will be a benefit to this board. So I present to you Dr. Um, Dr. Bernard Bailey with um, John Skirvin from Senior Services. Thank you, Shernita, and thank you for inviting us here to make this presentation. Um, I'm John Skirvin. I'm the CEO at Senior Services of Southeastern Virginia. We are your area agency on aging for the uh, Southampton Roads. Our, com our companion agency, or sister agency, is the Peninsula Agency on Aging on the Peninsula. Um, I'm delighted to be able to work with Dr. Bailey and uh, present in a very brief fashion our blueprint for a livable community for Chesapeake. Um, Dr. Bailey. Thank you. Good morning. I'm here kind of as a, a side of a part to what Mr. Skirvin has, but I really believe that this is a, a part of Chesapeake's leadership, the council, and as well as uh, Mr. Baker, in terms of making sure that um, our city has a comprehensive plan for all the citizens that we have. It's very easy to have a comprehensive plan for land use, as you well know, but when you start talking about people, that's a little bit different. So what we've decided to do is to look at how we can indeed plan for our citizens in terms of resources and meeting their needs. The first thing um, that we um, decided to look at was a comprehensive plan for children 
and then we just kept on going with a comprehensive plan for um, our um, 65 or better is what you see here, but we really did it for 55 or better. One of the things that we really wanted to consider was how do you look at um, this population? Chesapeake, as you know, is very unique in that it has about 25% children, about 25% that are 55 or better, and then the remaining in between. The plan that you're looking at is for about 25 years. So why would we look at something that's going to be 25 years? Because, as you well know, your millenniums are going to be the ones that are going to be taking care of us as we move forward. We hope. We hope. <laughs> well, that's how come we're planning, so that they can do that. Um, in Chesapeake, if things continue as they're going, we're looking at doubling our population when it comes to the number of people who are going to be 65 or better. Um, the generational, I'm sure I didn't come out completely. Um, we kind of looked at um, what we call the silent generation as well as um, the baby boomers and Generation X. And I'm not sure, you probably have to look on paper to see it because it's not exactly coming up so that you can see how the numbers change as we move through the years um, and, and we grow um, poor. So I think it's important that we consider, again, um, the entire um, generation, not just those that are 55 or better. The next um, slide that you see is really how we got there. We call this our money slide because you can take this and this tells it all. This tells exactly what it is that we wanted to do and how we wanted to get there. And um, we'll go through that um, quickly um, as we move forward. But one of the first things um, that we had to do was to get the right people together to be able to do that. Who are our stakeholders that are engaged? And I would recommend that you know your communities better than anyone and that you use those stakeholders. So if you go to the, the next slide, you'll see where Chesapeake used um, the stakeholders. And the, the value in this is that it was not to be a city project. We wanted to be very clear that it was to be a community project. And in order to do that, you can see how diverse in terms of who we had in order to participate. We had everybody from the chamber to the hospital to bank um, personnel that were engaged, business persons, Virginia employment, because um, we wanted everybody to have, if you will, skin in the game. And if you really want to know who has skin in the game, you ask what is going to pony up some money so that we can get a consultant to come in and help you to do the plan. And we did have persons to come, our organizations to come to the table to be able to do that. Um, Town Bank contributed. The shopper contributed in terms of helping to make sure in-kind services that we had. Um, financial contribution by Chesapeake Regional. Of course, the city um, provided some funding. And of course, um, senior services was a, a big part in terms of moving this forward. One of the, um, the tasks that we had was, what was it that we really wanted to accomplish? And I think our vision and goal speaks to what we wanted to do. But again, the, the major things that we wanted to do was to make sure that we had everybody engaged. It wasn't, even though the plan, like I said, was for those that were 55 or better, it is one that goes for all generations and how do we move that forward. And the other thing was to make sure that we had everyone engaged in the community in terms of resources and information in order to make the plan successful. So we were fortunate enough to be able to look at um, some areas. Uh, when you get a, a group that sides together, you get lots of energy, uh, positive energy, but everyone has a different direction and a different focus that they want to look at. But what we did was we actually took a survey of, of within the, that group in terms of how we wanted to move things forward and to set priorities. And the group set five priorities that they felt was so. And this was before we did any type of survey or any type of information, just so that we could have an idea or a concept to move forward. Housing, transportation, health care, financial safety and security, and quality of life. No surprises to anyone that those would be the top five when we're considering that age group. But also, I think that if you continue to discuss, you'll know that that's something that we needed to address for all the ages. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Skirvin. He'll tell us how we move forward from there. Thank you. 
the, the plan design, this was a really comprehensive uh, effort. It took about a year to actually bring it to fruition. I should say that Chesapeake City Council actually adopted this comprehensive plan for seniors at their December, uh, at one of their December council meetings. Um, and so what we did was we really talked to a lot of senior citizens. Uh, we are blessed in this region with more senior citizens than any other part of Virginia. And so we got to ask the people what it is that they think is important. We did a, a major uh, uh, survey of seniors. We held multiple community uh, discussions. We worked with focus groups from the healthcare field, from the parks and recreation, from public safety. And you, and you can see that as we worked through our various activities, we ultimately brought back our uh, plan for the formal approval by all of the stakeholders, boards of directors. Uh, next slide, please. I want to just briefly tell you what senior citizens see as what's important for their high quality of life. Again, no surprises, but the question for us as a region is how do we create the environment where people have the financial means, are able to stay mentally active, physically active, and where they can stay connected to family and friends. I can tell you the research shows uh, senior citizens don't want to live with their kids and they don't want their kids to live with them. The, <laughs> just the truth. The most preferred living arrangement for a senior citizen is to have your kids 20 minutes away so that they will take care of you. And this is scary because millennials will be senior citizens at the end of this plan. Um, next slide, please. One of, my, uh, one of the things that I think is really uh, important to know is that this is where people told us, and this is a, a compilation of not only the seniors, but also the various professionals and others, where we need to make our investments as a community. And that's not just municipal dollars. It's dollars from all of the sources that are out there, including the private sector, the public sector, um, uh, such as uh, senior services, which is actually a private nonprofit. That's affordable medical care, affordable housing, better transportation, options and senior centers. And I would say that there's a whole lot of ways of getting that done, if I could go to the next slide. Um, and what we really focused on then was developing, developing a plan that was, that was easy to do, well, not easy, but that could be done, that was measurable, that was not overly ambitious, and that could flex over time as our needs change in the region. The big takeaways here are, remember th that as Americans, as citizens of Hampton Roads, it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves. So a lot of this is around educating consumers as well as uh, planners and developers about what age-friendly housing is. This region is going to double the number of seniors over the next 25 years. At the end of this plan period, you will have about one in five to one in four of our citizens will be senior citizens. So with that said, we really have to improve accessibility and the planning and development must include innovative approaches which really create living environments, neighborhoods if you will, um, somehow to uh, modify the suburbanization of our region so that people can stay connected and can get to walk or use public transit to get to where they need to go. Because if you go to the next slide with transportation, what we've got as a reality is that on average men live seven years after they have to stop driving and women live ten years and that's because women outlive men. So, just the truth. So, um, with that said, what we really want to do is focus on those areas of our, of, our, of our municipalities that have high concentrations of seniors and then not only look at how one might expand public transportation or create public transportation in those jurisdictions that don't have it, but as importantly, how we coordinate all of the assets. I dare say there are a huge number of vehicles on the road from a huge number of organizations, faith communities, uh, planning uh, uh, community services boards. We operate a fleet of 60 uh, which need to be coordinated. 
And there is a model in Jacksonville, Florida, where multiple entities are all involved, and there are others around the country as well, in what they call a one call, one click, and, which is where the rider calls or clicks and is matched to the provider that can provide the ride to where they need to go. And we have actually the one call, one click uh, capability right now at the Planning Council with the 211. Next slide, please. In terms of health care, this plan does not cure cancer. We actually talked about doing that, but we figured it was too big of a job for the city of Chesapeake. So what it does do, though, is it really places a concept of empowerment of our citizens so that they can take responsibility for their own wellness and preventive care that we also will have in this region. And again, we're blessed with great educational uh, uh, facilities a way to do uh, training so that we can have the availability of a highly trained healthcare workforce and that we really educate folks to use appropriate use of medical care so, um, so that we are doing two things. A, we are helping people to improve their health and B, that we are helping people to use less municipal services and, and bend the cost curve for all of us as taxpayers and now I have to ask you, how many people here have an advanced care directive? Please raise your hand. Okay, that's about the national average. Today is National Advanced Care Directives Day. Uh, I encourage you to have the conversation with your families and to create one for yourselves. We're happy to help you at Senior Services because that's also a critical issue for all of us and especially for people 55 and better unless you've got a teenager that rides a motorcycle. So with that said, I want to move on to social, financial safety and security. There, again, what we're looking to do is to create an environment, to create a community that shows respect and prevents elder abuse. That is a growing problem in our region. It is one that people don't like to talk about, but all of the social service departments can verify for you that we've got a huge issue there. And what we want to do is help people feel safe in their communities. And there are already efforts going on, I think, that are, are beginning to do that. And then um, in working with the sheriff's departments and the police departments, the no, uh, preventing financial scam, scams is a really achievable, uh, or preventing victimization by financial scams is really an achievable goal. Finally, in, er in the area of quality of life, um, Right now in America, right now in our region, one in four of us are caregivers. We're either caregivers for an older loved one or for a younger loved one. And if you think back to what Dr. Bailey said in terms of 25% of Chesapeake are kids, 25% of Chesapeake are seniors, there's 50% in the middle that are taking care of those folks. What we need to do is to create the environment through very measured act, um, engagement with, with citizens groups and with faith communities and with other elements of the community so that we can have active aging as a fundamental part of an everyday lifestyle. And what seniors told us in Chesapeake is that they want a senior center. There's more than one way to create a senior center, and I can give you actually Virginia Beach as an example, where there's a uh, senior center down in Pongo that was created and, and is staffed by a huge number of volunteers as opposed to being a city rec center, for instance. So um, as we go through this, it really takes us to the next and ongoing steps, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Bailey to wrap this up. One of the things that um, we must always consider is that um, Mr. Skirvin talked about how we buy into what's going on. And when I say we, it's really the community as a whole. Each of those entities that you saw that are part of the think tank, 
took that information or took the plan back to their respective boards and had them to also validate it or to approve it. And in the case of our city council, they adopted it for us to move forward on. It's not one of an investment so much of money because we all know that that's a very sensitive issue when you talk about using city dollars relative to some of the plans that we have. But it is about how we can use the resources that we have in order to provide what we, what we need. What we will do is we're going to maintain the, what was the think tank to become the advisory board as we move forward with the plan. We're looking at having, at least internally for the city, a, a temporary position of where we'll have a coordinator that will be responsible for making sure that each of those five areas that we talked about, that there's a responsible party. Um, Mr. Skirvin spoke of Triad being kind of the responsible party, which is our sheriff's department, regarding making sure regarding the safety and well-being for those when we talk about scams, et cetera, things of that nature. The health the um, Chesapeake Regional has been a val invaluable when it comes to moving forward regarding the health care concerns and the issues that we address. So again, it is a matter of working together, revisiting where you are, and um, having an action plan for moving it forward. So again, thank you for the opportunity for us to, to be here. And if you have any questions, we're more than willing to address those. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bailey and uh, Mr. Skirvin. Any questions or comments? the presenters. All right, thank you. Good information. All right, next up on our agenda is our draft budget for fiscal year 2016. Our CFO, Ms. Nancy Collins, will come up and make that presentation. And we will have action on this item uh, during our <coughs> consent agreement for, uh, approval. Nancy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and citizens of Hampton Roads. I'd like to present to you a summary of the draft 2016 budget. As noted on the pages in your agenda, the overall revenues have decreased over the past six years from a high of $14 million to the current low of $9 million. These reductions are mainly due to the declining federal funding for the Homeland Security projects. In comparing the draft budget, previous page, Melton, please. In preparing the draft budget for fiscal year 16, the total fiscal year 2015, the anticipated, here shows the 7.8% decrease in funding. Next page. Expenditures decreased in all categories. Personnel by 3.7%, pass-through funds by 9.9%, and operations by 17.2%. Even with the projected 2% performance-based salary increase, the personnel cost decreased by 3.7% due to the elimination of two full-time positions. In doing our best to be good stewards of the public funds, by reorganizing workloads, we continue to do more with less, as most of you all so are doing. Next page, we continue to hope to continue funding our reserves with um, the anticipated surplus we're expecting this year after the audit adjustments are done. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions or comments? This, again, this is item uh, B on our consent agenda to be approved. The budget also has baked in it, uh, Ms. Collins, a uh, 2% increase uh, for uh, um, salaries that we won't act on until after we've gotten the feedback from all of the localities and what they're doing, but the, the number is 2% that's baked in. Uh, anything else there, Randy? That we need to okay, any questions, comments here? All right, very good. Next up for information is uh, um, a presentation on sea level rise, and Ben McFarland is going to uh, quickly get us through this. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So this morning I'd like to just give you an update on where we are in the region with several of the efforts that are going on that deal with sea level rise and recurrent flooding. As you may recall, last March the Commission voted to create a new committee of local staff on recurrent flooding and sea level rise. This committee has met several times since its first meeting last June. The focus of this committee is to be an, op an opportunity for local staff to come together and share information on what they're doing at the local level related to sea level rise and flooding, but also to interact with other organizations and entities throughout the region, particularly our academic partners. The universities around here are doing quite a bit of research on sea level rise. 
And um, in order to make this a, a more effective process, uh, the committee agreed at its last meeting in March uh, to increase the frequency uh, to every other month as opposed to once a quarter. Um, and they're also going to be working to help provide the staff here uh, with specific uh, guidance on our work program related to sea level rise. And one of those specific tasks that we're working on right now is an update to our regional sea level rise inundation maps. Uh, the picture there is actually from our last report that was issued in 2013. And the new maps are going to be based on the same methodology that we used for that report. Uh, the main difference is going to be a slight, a slight tweak to the me methodology, uh, but also um, we're going to be taking advantage of the new LIDAR data that we received this past fall uh, from the USGS. One of the things that we're very excited here um, at, with the staff is, is this Dutch Dialogues workshop that we're trying to bring here to Hampton Roads. As you may remember, uh, the Dutch Dialogues are a, a charrette-style workshop that brings together local stakeholders, staff, and Dutch experts on water management from engineering, hydrology, landscape architecture, and planning uh, to discuss and identify potential solutions to, uh, to water management issues from an integrative design perspective. And uh, where we are in the process right now is last week we actually met with um, David Wagoner, who's an architect from New Orleans, who led the initial Dutch dialogue down there with the Dutch, the Dutch Embassy. And also Dale Morris from the, from the Dutch Embassy came down. And we went around to several of our candidate locations here, um, two in Norfolk, one in Chesapeake, one in the Hampton Newport News area, and one in Portsmouth. And uh, based on the input from, from Dale and from David, uh, we selected the New Market Creek watershed and the Tidewater District of Norfolk as our, as our candidate locations for the Dutch Dialogues. This is just an aerial photograph of those two areas. One of the, um, the primary selling points for both of these was the, the large scale of the area, which provided a diverse range of both situations, uh, scales, problems, and it also appeal to our Dutch, our Dutch partners. And our next step, actually, for this is we're going to be finalizing the dates. In fact, we have a conference call that we just scheduled for this afternoon with our, our Dutch partners. Uh, so we'll finalize those dates for the middle of June, and then we'll begin working with uh, the cities of Hampton, Newport News, and Norfolk to finalize some of the logistics for site visits uh, for the workshop, but also for related events surrounding uh, that workshop. And we will keep uh, the localities informed through both our re regional environmental committee and our special committee on recurrent flooding and sea level rise. The, uh, just an update on something that we are not directing, but we are of someone involved in. It's the National Disaster Resilience Competition is a uh, grant program managed by HUD that will provide approximately $1 billion to eligible applicants throughout the country to address and promote integrated or innovative responses to uh, natural hazards, so to develop more resiliency in communities across the country. Uh, the phase one applications were due in March. Uh, those are, are going to be uh, reviewed by HUD. They're curr currently being reviewed. And the expected date for when those uh, will be announced for the, to advance to phase two is going to be sometime in June. At that point, those applicants that are actually invited to participate um, will have 120 days to prepare their phase two submissions. And then in October, uh, those will be due. And then in December, that's the, the target for when HUD will announce the winners of phase two. And the way this, this grant is set up is that uh, eligible applicants are those that had presidentially declared disasters between 2011 and 2013. In Virginia, the only eligible applicant is the state, so the Department of Housing and Community Development is heading up that application process. The first step is to actually identify communities which meet certain threshold requirements. And so far, uh, several areas in Norfolk and Chesapeake have been specifically identified as meeting those threshold requirements. Uh, for our, the next steps moving forward, while we wait to hear back from HUD on whether or not Virginia will be able to move forward in phase two, we'll be working to identify additional eligible communities throughout Hampton Roads and the Eastern Shore and to uh, develop some draft strategies for the phase two applications so that if we are selected, we won't be starting at, at square one, we'll be um, ahead of the curve. <clears throat> one of the things that we are actually doing here at the PDC has been working with the United States Geological Survey Office out of Richmond on a series of efforts related to land subsidence, uh, particularly uh, dealing with uh, sea level rise, but also with groundwater. And we recently finished, uh, I think this was issued in December 2013, a report that addressed the connection between land subsidence and relative sea level rise in our area. And we recently signed a contract with USGS to provide us a bit more guidance on moving forward with how to monitor subsidence um, in the future. And the next step for this, we'll actually have a technical advisory group meeting in June. We'll have a national expert from USGS, Michelle Sneed, at that meeting. And the PDC, again, will we'll keep the staff informed through the recurrent flooding and the uh, Regional Environmental Committee meeting. 
One of the, uh, the larger issues or things that's going on in the region right now, as you may have heard, is this uh, ODU's intergovernmental pilot project. Um, the vision, as stated in the charter for this pro pilot project, is to create an intergovernmental planning organization that can effectively coordinate the sea level rise preparedness and resilience planning of federal, state, and local government agencies and the private sector, taking into account the perspectives and concerns of the citizens of the region. Uh, the pilot project, they've held several meetings uh, since they kicked it off last summer. Um, so far, from what we've seen, there's been a, quite a bit of federal interest and participation, uh, but less participation and interest from state and local partners. Um, as called in the chart, called for in the charter, um, several working groups have already been put together, uh, composed of both federal, state, some local staff, and, a, and a private um, stakeholders. These working groups include infrastructure, private infrastructure, scientific technology, civic engagement, and land use. And together, the organizers for the pilot project and the working group, uh, the working groups have identified um, several del deliverables that they hope to accomplish by the end of next summer. Uh, these include developing a template for regional cooperation that can be shared across the country, uh, a regional strategic planning process for how to deal with sea level rise, the development of an integrated federal, non-federal sea level rise monitoring network, de determining an appropriate regional sea level rise scenario and appropriate risk assessment tool for Hampton Roads, and the prioritization of vulnerable critical infrastructure. In addition to all those efforts that are going on in the region, uh, there are a couple state efforts that are also going on. One is the Governor's Climate Change and Resiliency Update Commission. Both Mayor Wright and I serve on, uh, on that commission. And right now they are uh, preparing to meet uh, next week uh, for their, uh, their next uh, full commission meeting. Uh, each of the work groups, there have been four or five that have been established, are developing recommendations that will be considered by the full commission. And those final recommendations are going to go to the governor at the end of July. And the guidance that we've been given for those recommendations is that they should be implementable by the governor within the next two years. And each of those working groups has been uh, restricted to only three recommendations with only five pages to summarize them in. So it will be uh, not quite as, as heavy a report as the Kane Commission, but certainly something I think that the governor should be able to act upon. And also, uh, the Joint Subcommittee on Recurrent Flooding at the General Assembly con continues to meet. And their next meeting will be on May 12th in Richmond. That concludes my remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Ben, very much. Thank you. Okay, the last item on our workshop agenda, uh, Julia Hillegoss is going to uh, take us through and give us an update on our legislative uh, session. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to take a couple minutes to give you a brief update. Um, session is, is over that we can do yesterday. And, uh, I do. I have to go back tomorrow to wrap some things up. So I didn't get it all done yesterday. But uh, of the 2,776 bills introduced, 719 of them were passed. If you like baseball, they're only batting 260. So that might be a good thing. Maybe it's like golf, the low score wins. I, I don't know. Um, so some things of interest to you all. Uh, they did establish the Eastern Virginia Groundwater Management Advisory Committee. Uh, this is integral to part of the state's effort in water supply planning, and of course, um, Whitney and our water resources staff will uh, most likely be very involved in that. Also, registration of wells as another way to get a better handle on groundwater use. That legislation passed, and there's also a JLARC study on water resources and the whole um, water planning, water supply effort. Lots of things in water resources. Um, the state also is tasked with reviewing and updating their Commonwealth Flood Protection Plan. DEQ has um, two years to study the impacts of stormwater regulations in areas like ours with seasonally high water table. And of interest particularly to you all, all localities in Hampton Roads, as you review your comprehensive plan, will now be required to take a look at and develop some strategies to uh, address sea level rise in your localities. So regulations are fine and good, but the real test is where they put the money. Um, pleased to report to you that there's an increase of over $10 million for agriculture, uh, BMP cost share, and technical assistance, primarily through solar water conservation districts, of which um, we have three that service our region. There's an additional $5 million in general fund for um, stormwater uh, local assistance fund. Some modest funding that is back in the budget that's been missing for a few years for the Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service. And also there is a loan fund established uh, for, to help residents with establishing living shorelines. 
economic development, there was a million dollars appropriated for what's known as the Community Business Launch Program. That's exactly what it sounds. It's basically to help localities um, develop incubators for um, launching new businesses. The Governor's Opportunity Fund has an increase in the budget in both current year and next year. Um, and also a $4 million increase to the Virginia Housing Trust Fund. A million dollars for rapid lease housing. That's for people who have um, lost their residences for whatever reason and to get them reestablished in, in housing again. Also uh, directs the Housing Commission to identify dedicated court, uh, sources of funding to move things forward. Education, not really our bailiwick, but something I know that's uh, of importance to you all. All of our uh, state-supported colleges and universities have received increases for next year in undergrad financial aid. There's also additional funds for most of them, <coughs> excuse me, for their base operations. And then in uh, K-12 education, there's some increases for lottery proceeds, um, four and a half million current year, and another um, almost 22 million for next year. Some random things that were on our agenda um, that we were watching or supporting or not, um, that didn't really make the cut. You know, we have a, a local delegate who has repeatedly attempted to exempt churches from storm order fees. I know some of you did sort of a back of the envelope math on that, and that could be very costly um, to all localities in the area. That did not pass. Uh, recycling requirements, there was a push to require bars and restaurants in particular to increase their recycling because of the amount of glass and aluminum uh, and things like that in those businesses, that did not make it. Plastic bag uh, legislation made it a little further this year, but um, still did not make the cut, uh, nor did balloon releases. PDC funding is, is inching up a bit. We're not where we want to be, of course, but um, you know it's better than it has been in previous years. And of course, we always say we're against unfunded mandates. That might be a little pipe dream. We may just want to drop that off, because that's never really going to happen. But um, anyway. So it was, it was a good session, I think. Um, our delegation was um, very much available, um, appreciated your words of wisdom, and um, look forward to working with us in the future. Our liaisons, I want to have a special shout out to Ms. Sherry Neal with City of Portland. She's a huge help, always available to me, and just knows more than, than I'll ever know. Um, so Sherry's a, a great asset. Uh, their recommendations as far as moving forward with their committee, because we're going to have to start this all over again in six months, is to maybe whittle down our agenda, which was almost 10 pages this year, and maybe do a you know, top five, and really focus on what's um, truly important that everybody can agree, agree on in the region. So, any questions? Okay. Any questions or comments for you? Okay. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much. Okay, this time we'll enter into our regular agenda. We have uh, in your package submitted public comments as well as this transcribed comment. Uh, and for our public comment period here, I have one speaker, Mr. Ellis W. James. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. My name is Ellis W. James. I'm a resident of Norfolk, Virginia, and a lifetime resident at that. I'd like to correct the record on something that has been floating around, and I think you will catch it right away. The EPA Clean Energy Plan is not I repeat, is not closing coal-fired plants. You don't have to take my word for that. Pull it up, check it out, and you will find out that in essence what is really happening is that the natural gas lower prices are the main trigger. That's not my opinion only, that is 
something that we all in Hampton Roads and Virginia need to be fully aware of because of the impending push to try to do fracking in the eastern part of Virginia, which will exacerbate the sea rise situation that we're now looking at and talking about. Let me give you a quick example, and it may seem at first blush that it is not applicable, but I think if you think about it, uh, it will be obvious. Recent reports have resulted from studies that were made in Colorado to find out why California is suffering so at this current moment. One third of the water from the Colorado River is being diverted to farms and crops. I want to be sure I'm clear. I am not against the farmers. And I'm certainly not against the farmers in Virginia. But I think that is a perfect example of how we can learn from what's happening in other areas. And I hope that you all will pay close attention to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. All right, item 10 on our agenda is approval of the consent items. Uh, is there a motion to approve? And, and before we get that motion, item E on it, the board room audio for um, this room, just to let you know that the Personnel and Budget Committee uh, unanimously approved the recommendation of the staff to uh, select the uh, Whitlock Company to uh, redo the entire system inside here, including a five-year warranty and uh, maintenance agreement. So with that, uh, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, the Chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items. So moved. Right, moved by Franklin. Second. Second. Second by Newport News. All in favor? Aye. Aye. On the vote, same much. Thank you. Okay, next item is the uh, three-month tentative schedule. Anything exciting in there? Anything? Just to do that Okay, good. Second. 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 Uh, the chair, uh, we will be, as you probably all heard yesterday, our treasurer will be relocating to the beautiful city of Richmond and uh, taking on a new task. And we want to congratulate her for all of her hard work and, uh, um, and what she's done to not only the city of Suffolk but to this region and what she's done on this board and on the executive committee. And so we want to thank you for that. But she leave us in a position of needing to have an interim treasurer until this term ends, and without even asking, uh, Vice Mayor Lewis Jones from the city of Virginia Beach <laughs> <laughs> volunteered to take that position. He said the mayor recommends, or the chair recommends, that we appoint uh, Mr. <coughs> Vice Mayor Jones to uh, complete that term for the remainder. Is there a so uh, there? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> moved by the city of Suffolk. <laughs> It was more like an appointment for me. Is <laughs> 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 a second? Frank, all in favor of uh, Vice Mayor Jones becoming the uh, interim treasurer for the uh, remainder of this term? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Same right. All right, next up we have uh, uh, two resolutions. <laughs> um, <laughs> and after we present these two resolutions, we'll have a motion for close. And if Ms. Kelly will. Oh, yeah, oh, I, I, I'm sorry. That's exactly right. This time, we open the doors and see if there are any uh, TPO members here because we want them present for these uh, resolutions that we're going to uh, present as well as we want the members present for going into closed session to handle the uh, personnel matter.
Mr. At this time, uh, we have two, uh, again, resolutions of appreciation that we want to present. One of them is to uh, Brenda Carton, Garton, I'm sorry, uh, County Administrator in Gloucester for her years of uh, service here on our committee and this board and her contribution. And the other one, and we won't read that one because I don't think she's here. Oh my <laughs> okay. and add another item that we're going to terminate Randy Keaton <laughs> as his advisor to the chair. <laughs> Would you please join myself? And this is a joint resolution from the PDC and the TPO. So I'm going to ask the Mayor Price if he would uh, join me here in uh, making these presentations to uh, both of these. Uh, gifted and talented individuals who have given uh, their very best to their localities and to our region. And Mayor Price, if you will take uh, our uh, county administrator first, and I'll do the mayor, um, the mayor, uh, the mayor of Richmond next. We're at Selena's Puppy Glen.
Thank you so much for the ability and the opportunity to serve. Okay, and at this time, we've got a motion to go into closed session. Um, Mayor Holman. The next item of business before the drinking of the planning district commission is to advise all members of the commission present that it is in my judgment appropriate for the board to enter into a closed meeting authorized, as authorized by the Virginia Freedom Information Act. This closed meeting will be restricted to only those members only those matters specifically exempted from closure pursuant to section 2.2-3711A of the Virginia Code. The closed meeting is held for the purpose of personnel matters, section 2.2-3711A1. And I make that motion to go into closed session. Move by Mayor Is there a second? Second. Second by Mayor Clerk Mills. All in favor of going into closed session? That's for crap? Aye. Aye. All right, we are in closed session. Okay, members of the commission are certified that to the best of their knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and only such business, public business matters as was proposed under the motion under which the proposed meeting was convened, were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting by the commission. I make that motion. Second. Just a second. Move and proper second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Do we need to do a roll call? Pardon me. We need to call the roll call. Thank you.